I, I, I understand. Uh, your time is valuable and we have a large number of people uh, assembled. It would be lovely to actually catch up like, uh, like we do when we do get, when we get together. Uh, I know that you asked me specifically for a super long formal introduction because that makes you incredibly comfortable. So uh, this is a I, typical of Frank Wood uh, humor, I think, right? <laughs> everybody understands that. <laughs> everybody, everybody understands that. I was just going to say that this is exactly the opposite. Max is, is uh, uh, so I'll, 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 I'll introduce Max and say he's a full professor research chair at the University of Amsterdam. And Microsoft uh, started a, a whole new office for him after his stint at Qualcomm in, in Amsterdam, working on machine learning for the physical sciences. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll just I'll, I'll go on to say that uh, uh, for all of you who don't know Max, which, uh, first of all, it's a it's a major mistake. You should go look at his Google Scho Google Scholar profile, read all of his papers. He's a spectac spectacular scholar and uh, uh, on top of that, an absolutely wonderful human being. So uh, we're lucky to have him here today. And uh, yeah, Max, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was a very nice introduction. A part, the, the part about human being, I will remember. That's very good. I like to be. I like to hear that. Thank you. You're very nice too, Frank. All right. So, can everybody see my screen? Is it visible? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. And if you'd like, I'll keep my video on so you at least have one person you're talking to. So, uh... yeah, I'm used to talking to screens. So, um, yeah, well, thank you so much, and a good morning to you. Uh, for in here, it's already six in the evening. Um, so I'm I'm happy that you could accommodate me, not in my late evening, um, but it does mean that you have to sit here uh, in the early morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, using deep learning to better understand science. Um, I should say there's a whole lot of things appearing on my screen. I hope they are not on your screen as well. They are not. People... Just your slides. Okay. Okay, so, okay, good. And just so you know, Max, I'll watch the chat channel. If, if people have questions and they type, type them in the chat channel, would you like me to interrupt you with their questions uh, or would you like to just steamroll through and take questions? No, I, I, actually, I think it's better and I'm quite happy to, uh, to skip actually uh, some slides if we have a good discussion. So feel free to, um, to you know, to ask questions. So, so everyone stick your stuff in the chat channel. I'll intercept and, and, and try to represent you to, to Max just to keep the flow going. But yeah, I think that's good. All right, fantastic. Um, yeah, so there we go. So these are the uh, brilliant people who did all the real work. And um, let me highlight a few things. Um, so of course, Taco Cohen has been instrumental in um, the whole equivariance stuff. And uh, here's his thesis. So if you want to dig deeper, uh, read his thesis. There's also a great paper by Maurice Weiler, and you'll see some uh, fantastic illustrations from him also in this talk. Also worthwhile looking at this if you uh, like to learn more, um, and it's beautifully illustrated. Then there is this paper by uh, Mark Finzi um, and Andrew Wilson. And um, so um, I recommend this because um, it has a good software. So if you want to get into this and you don't want to Sort of try to understand all the sort of math and group theory, but you do want to get your equivariant kernel, um, then this piece of software will let you, you know, uh, you know, input certain things that are not maybe too difficult to figure out, and then actually it will compute for you the equivariant kernel. And then there's all these other great people who I've had the fortune of collaborating with, and you should check out all their papers. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a bit about symmetries and equivariance. Um, so I'm not sure how much people know about that. Um, so I'll just introduce it a little bit. I'll talk about graph neural networks. And then I'll uh, talk about my latest hobby, which is uh, equivariant GNNs for molecules and PDEs. And of course, this has something to do with sort of my new appointment at Microsoft Research, which is a new lab that is going to focus on molecular simulation and I'm going to return to my roots, which is uh, quantum mechanics again, which is very interesting stuff. And then I'll conclude. So this is one of those illustrations from that paper. And uh, this was to illustrate that you can actually do deep learning on manifolds. This is a sphere, uh, but you can do deep learning on arbitrary manifolds. And this is a paper that we wrote it's called Gates CNNs. I'll say a few more words about that. So, um, I'm inspired and, you know, and, and when Taco joined, uh, you know, maybe already seven or eight years ago or something, um, 
we were inspired by the symmetries. And um, symmetries, of course, play an incredibly important role in physics. In fact, they are perhaps the most unifying mathematical theory um, to you know, describe physics and to unify different, different theories, which look to describe different phenomena, but really are two sides of one coin. Um, perhaps there's two great examples. Um, one is electromagnetism. There was a separate theory for electricity and for magnetism um, before the turn of the previous century. And then um, James Clark Maxwell, by using Lorentz transformations, so Lorentz was a Dutch physicist actually, and he used this set of transformations which relate one observer to another observer, which moves relative to that observer with constant speed. And um, if and if you know, and it you can turn electricity into magnetism if you look at the phenomenon at different speeds, and by you know trying to put write your equations in such a way that they are valid for all observers which have constant relative speeds, you arrive at this beautiful unified theory of electromagnetism. And so, and one step further, um, what is something that um, Einstein did, he basically took uh, two phenomena, which all, again look very different at the time. One is uh, acceleration, so, and the other one is gravity. And he figured out that if you are in a rocket that accelerates and do an experiment with a ball falling on the ground, or if you are in some gravitational field, then actually, if you, don't, if you cannot look outside, you cannot distinguish these two things. And so really, these are two sides of the same coin. They're related by a symmetry transformation. And by that single observation and some math, you basically derive the equations for general relativity, which is the, I guess, the most um, accurate description we have of, of gravity. And then um, one could argue that even further, the elementary particles of physics, so here, basically, they're all the particles that are known. Um, you know the quarks, which make up, of course, other particles, and leptons, and they're all, or, and, and then there's, of course, these, these these bosons, which are the the carriers of forces, and and then this 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 Higgs boson. So all of these are organized again uh, in through group theory. In fact, U1, SU2, and SU3, and these are all you can think of them as representations of groups. So that was our starting point. And sort of modestly, we observed that actually, you know, also in machine learning, there were some symmetries active, right? In a way, if you look at a picture, let's say you're trying to do some kind of medical diagnosis, you look at a pathology slide or some other sort of skin lesion, and you're trying to predict which, you know, what it is, you try to diagnose it, then the orientation of that particular picture doesn't change the class. And so there's something invariant about that prediction. And you want your neural networks to know about that particular symmetry or invariance. So here's another nice picture from the paper uh, by Maurice Weiler. Um, and so, uh, so Taka went on basically to define this principle of equivariance. And there was you know, some other people at DeepMind who also had a paper at the same time, Sander Dieleman et al. And this idea is that um, you basically want to think about you know, two operations which you want to commute. So you want to force that they are actually, it doesn't matter in which order you, uh, you apply those two operations. The first operation is a symmetry transformation. So here we have some object, and, you know, typically you think of clearly of an image, but let's say in this case, we have an egg. And we have, is, we have some kind of signal on the egg. In this case, it's a, it's a gecko. And we can sort of rotate this particular gecko around its symmetry axis. And so then we have this image. Now, we can also filter the image, the input image. And then we get this particular filtered image, right? And now it feels reasonable to say that if I would first rotate and then filter, or if I would first filter, and then rotate, I would get the same result. Now that is precisely what we call equivariance. So in other words, the neural network needs to be consistent with these kinds of symmetry operations which you can apply. Now, it feels reasonable, but it's not automatic. And that's the important thing. 
So what does something enforcing something like that do? And in fact, we find that it uh, creates interesting structure in the latent representations of these deep neural networks. Um, uh, so Hinton called these uh, capsules, um, but also in these group representations that we define, uh, we find these types of capsules. These are subspaces uh, which under symmetry transformations transform into each other as a subspace. So they don't mix with other subspaces. And I'll make this more precise in a minute. So you get these capsules where if you change something at the input, which is the symmetry operation, you sort of cycle or transform inside this capsule. And so you can think of that the specific, you know, activation pattern inside a capsule encodes for the pose of the object where the actual, you know, active, the total activation of that capsule would encode for the presence of an object. And of course, similar things have been observed in the brain as well in the cortex. Now, if, you know, it's clear from here that we have to find this thing to work on manifolds, and we'll say a little bit more about that as well. Now, what are the advantages of, uh, of sort of equivariance, of enforcing equivariance? Well, we know from translation symmetry that we can get a massive reduction in the number of parameters that we have to train, right? Now, if you take a normal multilayer perceptron and you have n input pixels and n output pixels, you'll get n squared parameters that you will have to fit. If you take a filter, so if you assume translation invariance or equivariance, then you will just have to do with filters and the filters, you know, there might be nine parameters. And if you have more filters, you have, you know, K times nine parameters. So that means that the number of parameters are much, much less. And that's if, if this inductive bias is correct, of course, you can learn much faster from much less data. So this is basically taking that idea one step further and say, well, maybe there's other symmetries like rotational symmetries, which would also um, help you reduce further the number of parameters that you would have to learn. As I mentioned, there's also a disentangling or an organization of your latent space in terms of capsules and pose and presence of objects. So it's also, it's, it also gives you structure in that space. And finally, um, you can think that the next layers will want to detect patterns that are presented to them from the layers below. And in order to make that easy, to make their life easy, it is good to create structure in these latent representations. For instance, if you know, if you would change, like uh, if you would shift an image by a tiny little bit, and this would create a random permutation of all the pixel values, then the next layer would have a very hard time latching on to structure um, in that representation. Okay, um, so one good property um, of um, sort of the, this equivariance assumption is that abstraction preserves symmetries. So in order to illustrate that, so here's these two operations, right? So, so here we have filtering and then symmetry operation or symmetry operation and then filtering. So what does that mean? Well, um, if I take an image, so uh, pixels, and I apply a symmetry transformation, in this case, it's a rotation, and I take another image and move it also on its orbit of its, of its symmetry transformation. And if I would have some operation which would abstract these two faces to a sort of abstract phase, which would be sort of a, a mapping that sort of, you know, uh, contracts, then we would be guaranteed that the abstraction also, I mean, that the rotated faces would also map to the same rotated abstraction. And that's, that's kind of a nice property to if you, if you want a neural network that creates abstractions as you go deeper into the layers of a neural net. So more formally, uh, mathematically, um, we have this closing diagram. Again, uh, we have a signal, we have a translation in this case is uh, some kind of symmetry operation. We have our CNN filtering. So first filtering and then translating should be the same as first translating and then filtering. Um, and you can sort of write this as you know, a function and then uh, sort of filtering and then symmetry or for symmetry and then function. Now note that these two, symmetry operations here and here do not have to be the same. They can actually be different operations because these spaces can simply be different. And that I will illustrate now. So think about um, an image, right? And this image, 
can be rotated like this, and it goes in the input of a neural net. Now, this neural network has an eye detector and a mouth detector, but we have now rotated the eye detector and mouth detector over 90 degrees angle, so we have four of them, right? So now, if we apply it to this input image, then uh, you know we get these detections, but clearly not these detections because they're at the wrong orientation. If we rotate the image, now two things happen. The first thing is that the actual detections rotate. But the second thing is that instead of this set of filters, now this set of filters at the right orientation fires. Now we call the first one an eye capsule and the second one a mouth capsule. And as I said, you know, the total activation, which is, let's say, the fact that it detects anything, is a encoding for the fact that this thing is there. There's eyes now, and there's a mouth now, but there's no football, so that the football detector didn't go off. The other thing is, in fact, the, the, the specific pattern inside your capsule encodes for the pose, in this case, the orientation. So we have a so the upright pose here, and we have a 90 degree uh, counterclockwise rotated pose here. And uh, so you can still efficiently perform these, these convolutions by this operation. Basically, you convolve over three different orientations and you store them in, th in four different feature maps or uh, channels. Um, so you would think that um, maybe this happens automatically if you just take a CNN. Uh, turns out it doesn't. So here we have very old uh, sort of video from Jan McCann's web page where, you know, under translations, you indeed see that all these filtered images do beautifully translate. So there's equivariance in that respect. But if you rotate, they don't, right? So you can see, you know, there's something that rotates, but also the feature maps actually change. And this is another beautiful illustration by Daniel Worrell, where here, you have the stabilized images of a normal CNN, which clearly changes under rotation, and one that is, uh, you know, the, his harmonic neural networks, which which were um, rotation equivariant. Okay, um, so we 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 uh, so we had developed these uh, these group equivariant neural networks, which I showed, which had this this discrete set of transformations. It turns out you can also define um, equivariant neural networks, which are uh, transformed properly under continuous set of transformations, not a, not a discretized set, like 90 degrees angles, but these are any angle. Um, and you would have to use a technology which is called uh, sort of irreducible representations. Um, so um, it, it's, it's slightly different, um, but you know, it, it turns in, you know, what kind of representation theory do you use for your group? And here you can see, um, so an input image with which we rotate. Here you see, the, of course, a stabilized view. Of course, uh, you know, nothing, nothing changes. Here is our hidden representation. This is a scalar layer where the outputs are scalars. And if you stabilize it, you see that nothing changes, which means it's equivariant. And here is a vector layer, which is a higher order representation. So now at every point we have a vector. And also here we see that you know we get funny transformations. However, when you stabilize things again, they don't change, which means um, the whole thing is equivariant. Okay, so I, I already mentioned this. So if you want to get going on this uh, particular problem, on this particular idea, uh, there is now quite nice code. Um, and basically, what you have to provide is um, between two layers, the input representation that you're interested in and sort of the output representation that you're interested in. So you have to specify the type of representation. And the other thing you need to specify is the generators of your group. And that's better than it was before because some groups have a huge number of elements, but only a very small number of generators. So rubrics cube, in fact, has you know, 10 to the 20 elements or so, but only six generators. And so with his code, you can actually figure out what the equivariant kernels are that you should use in your neural network. Um, to train equivariant neural networks. So that was the first sort of uh, idea. And um, that so there we looked at global symmetries, right? So if you rotate the entire input image um, and you expect that the map is invariant or equivariant on these sort of global transformations where every pixel get transformed. Now, um, in physics, interestingly, um, 
there is also something called local symmetries. And um, it turns out that that's the mathematics that you need in order to describe general relativity. So in general relativity, people think about arbitrary coordinate transformations in curved spaces. And it turns out you get into very interesting phenomenon. So in flat space, and now this, I'm not gonna translate that idea of that problem to you know, deep learning. So in deep learning, we are interested in a filter. So a filter is basically, you know, if you want a vector or co-vector, and we want to take the inner product of this sort of co-vector with the you know, information that's underlying on the manifold, in this case, the plane. So that's easy right on a, plat on a flat surface. You just take the inner product of the part of this image with this particular filter and you get, an, and you get a point that you then store in the center. Now, if you wanna go somewhere else, you just move your kernel to some other place and then you do exactly the same thing there. And that's independent of how you moved your kernel. The problem is that in a curved space time, this is no longer true. And what happens there is if you, for instance, on a cube and you sort of do the best you can in parallel transforming or, or transporting this particular kernel from here to here, then uh, if you go through this path, or if you go through this path, it turns out that these two things are actually now not the same. So the transport depends on the path that you makes things a little harder. And you, here there's another way this, you can cut open your cube. And then this is one way to parallel transport it. But then if you go this way, there is this angle deficit. And if you go from here to here, you have to rotate. So the question becomes, how do you actually deal with this? And this sort of, of course, the, the, the most interesting application of this is, uh, um, you know, uh, for instance, wind patterns or something on, on the surface of the earth. So spheres are clearly um, sort of interesting objects on which you might want to do deep learning. Um, but more, more generally, you might want to do deep learning on arbitrary manifolds. And in this idea, which, which we call gauge CNNs, we sort of work this out in more detail. It's a bit too technical to go into very much. But again, the problem has to do with the fact that it is impossible to define a global frame or naturally a global frame for which, uh, you know, for, for these, uh, for these filters, right? So because if you wanna define a global frame and then you take parallel transport, I mean, you don't have to use parallel transport, but if you take parallel transport to take this or you take this path, you know, then suddenly things have rotated. And so the solution is to give every point their own frame. Um, and then basically say, well, well, we'll do a convolution, but up to the ambiguity of that frame. So we do a convolution up to an, a rotation sort of a two-dimensional SO2 rotation of this frame. So, um, so basically, and, and then you basically figure out how you would uh, trans, uh, transform like a convolution that you did here to a convolution that you did here um, by basically figuring out again, very sim some, something that's very similar to equivariant. You just, you just say, oh, this is the frame here and this is the frame here is a particular transformation that's very similar to the one that I described to transform the result on one point to the result at another point. So that solves that particular problem. And to make that practical, actually, we, we looked at a, a discretized version of that problem. So we turn a continuous manifold in a mesh. So now there's a bunch of points and there's just sort of these, these flat spaces in the middle. And then curvature happens because there's some kind of angle deficit here at a particular point. Um, and what's important is that this, if you wanna do sort of a convolution on this manifold or a convolution on this manifold, they are really different. This has to do with the fact that this angle is different from this angle. And the reason is many people used graph neural networks, which basically treat this as an arbitrary graph to do these computations on these manifolds. And it turns out that is really suboptimal because it would treat this and this as exactly the same. And we'll go into a little bit more detail. So basically, um, maybe it's maybe it's better to skip this one, but what's happening here is this is the formulation of this gauge CNN formulated on a sort of meshed surface. And so basically there's two operations you need to do. It looks a lot like a graph neural net, but there's two things you have to do. You have to, um, parallel transport and you have to 
or reorient the frame. So you have to match the two frames. So because they were they were defined to be different frames at different points, you have to match right, the frames. I'm, I'm going to jump in and try to, to try to help you with a couple of a couple of questions. I'm just uh, like, can you define more clearly parallel transport and an angle deficit? Right. So parallel transport is that I'm only going to do this. Uh, basically, um, um, I'm going to do this sort of approximately here. So I think a parallel transport is defined in different geometry, but it is the natural way you would think you would take a vector that's living on the manifold, a vector lives on the tangent space. So this is the tangent space to the manifold. And you just take a vector, you define it here, and then you take a curve on the manifold. And then you want to sort of transport, you know, this vector from, from one tangent plane to another tangent plane, right? And I think maybe here, this is the easiest place where you can see it. So here, here it's flat. So in, in, when things are flat, it's the intuitive thing, which is you basically, you take a vector here in the space and you just move it parallel. But then when you get, I mean, also on these places, it's quite easy. You just, you know, you, you, you do what you would geometrically do. You just move it over the edge, right? And then if you to do this at home, you'll find if you go this path or this path, you actually get a rotated copy. And and the dangle F, angle deficit is basically here. So So here, I cut out a piece of space. This is no space. There's nothing here, right? But if I parallel transport, let's say this filter from here to here, or if I go from here to here, but then there is nothing here. So I basically have to, whenever I go start to go through here, it sort of reappears here, right? But the problem is since this angle is gone, this thing, as it comes out, you know, you have to rotate it so that it sticks out here, you know, with the, you know, in this way here, in this direction. Yeah, sure. That was that was that was clear. It was less the angle deficit thing was less clear when you were looking at the at the the the, the other graph. Right? Here, yeah. So yeah, here it's harder to figure out what the angle deficit is. But there's the angle deficit here as well. But if you cut this open, let's say along this line here, and you flatten it, then you you'll find there is a piece missing here. And if you flatten it, I'll I'll, I'll skip this further. Um, so this this may have been the the, the hardest part of the whole talk. Um, so, so this, the, ne the next thing that we want to do is we want to say, and, and sort of, and when we got interested in molecules, so we want to, we want to um, sort of, for instance, um, understand the dynamics of molecules, right? So there is these molecules, they have forces acting on them and velocities. And we would like to understand over time how this molecule sort of wiggles and jiggles as it moves through space. Uh, so people use uh, Newtonian dynamics, basically. Um, so they compute forces, and then from these forces, they move them. This is what basically underlied um, alpha fold, if you want. What we are going to do now is to map this onto a graph, um, let's say a graph neural network. We're going to then embed, let's say, compute embeddings on these nodes, like we would do on a normal image where every pixel would now be a point like this, but now the, the underlying structure is a graph. And we would then compute properties of these atoms um, and this is velocity or something like this and move a little bit along that velocity. Um, so for that, I will first introduce a graph neural net. What, what is a graph neural net? So graph neural net um, is basically, um, so, so let's first think about a little bit what is a, how, how we can represent the normal convolutions. Convolution, you can think of a message passing update. So here's the convolution where we take the filter, there's, there's pixel values on those filters and they take the inner product with the underlying image. And then we take, we store the, the values here. So here we have, basically, if you look at each one of these points here as a neighbor, so here, here are these, these neighbors, they are sending a message to the central node and then you add up all these messages. Now here we have one feature map, but we typically have a whole bunch of these feature maps, which means that at each one of these pixels, we basically have a vector sitting here. On each one of these, we have a vector. We, we then multiply the vector with the matrix. We add up all the messages, and then we find, you know, we, we store the value here in the center. Now the problem, so if this is a regular grid and always comes at the same orientation, then in fact, you can use different matrices to multiply with these vectors. But if you have an arbitrary graph, that somehow doesn't work anymore because I have drawn it this way, but it's pretty random. I could have taken this node and draw, drawn it here and it would be exactly the same graph. So this means that 
I cannot rely on a fixed ordering of those neighboring nodes, and nor can I rely on the number of those neighbors to be the same. So how can we still define some kind of message passing scheme such that for any ordering of those neighbors, I will still get the same result. I don't want the result to depend on how I go through my neighbors when, when I send messages. The first solution uh, was proposed uh, already maybe 10 years ago or so, where we basically use the same weights here um, to do these message passing. So we, if every neighbor uses exactly the same weight, then it doesn't matter how I order um, these neighbors. And then I could divide by the number of neighbors to make it completely independent of the number of neighbors. Um, there's ge more general message passing schemes. So you can think of those as convolutions on graphs, which goes as follows. So you take the feature vectors at the node. So here's a node and here's a node. And I'm going to now compute this particular message. So you have hi and hj, which are the two values here. I have some additional information, some constant information. I take an arbitrary function, could be a neural net, to map this to a message, which is going to move from here to here. Then I'm going to aggregate all these messages, oops, maybe by summing them. And then finally, when I have this sort of aggregated set of messages, I combine it with my h value here. Uh, so maybe some constant information at that node, as well as these aggregated messages, push them through another nonlinear function to get my next feature vector at that node. And I repeat that uh, many times, and that's, and that's called a graph convolution. So we're going to use that graph convolution to compute, for instance, let's say force fields. That's why I'm interested in these graph neural nets. Um, a force field, let's say, is the force or the velocity which acts on a particular atom in a molecule. Now, this feels like a simple task because, you know, after all, this is just Newtonian mechanics, right? We take the derivative of the position of, a, of an atom and say that's the velocity. And then we take the derivative of the velocity of the atom times its mass, and that's going to be given by the force. Um, now, the force is going to be minus the gradient of some potential function u. Um, and you would argue you can compute u because, you know, there is, for instance, this atom, you know, applies a force to this atom, they repel or they attract or something like this. That's true, but there's also the electrons, right? And the electrons sort of wave over this and through this thing here. And they can really only be treated with quantum mechanics. And, then, and quantum mechanics on a bunch of electrons is an NP-hard problem or worse. And so it's, it's when, when the number of electrons gets, uh, you know, in the hundreds, you know, it's a pretty impossible or very, very tough way, way to compute using quantum mechanics, you know, these, these, these potentials here. So it's best to approximate them. There's, of course, in the, in the chemistry and quantum chemistry, there is beautiful approximation schemes developed. Um, we want to approximate them with a neural net. So let me say a few more things about molecules and why they are cool. So first of all, um, you know, everything is made of molecules. All matter is made of molecules. Um, of course, there is, molecules are themselves made of smaller things, but basically almost everything, you, know, may, you have, may have plasmas, you have some forces like light, electromagnetism, and gravity. All the other things are basically made of matter. And um, once you understand matter, uh, you can basically design new materials. The thing is, though, that we don't really understand molecules all that well. We can write down the elementary equations of motion or the equations for matter molecules, but we can't really simulate them in a computer. You know, with the advance of quantum computation in 10 years or so, we might be able to do a lot better. Um, but for now, the best approach seems to be to use machine learning. Now, what can we do once we do, once we are able to simulate molecules better? The first thing we can do is, for instance, drug discovery. We can take, we can try to design molecules that bind to, to certain diseases, and we can try to make sure that they sort of stop certain processes that we that we um, that we want to stop because they make people sick, right? And so that's uh, that's drug discovery. Then there is uh, photovoltaics, which is turning light into energy. Also, there, you know, photocells. There's uh, the design of the molecules here that will turn light into electricity. Then um, lubricants, so 20% of 
all the energy that we lose is basically through friction. And so better lubricants could, you know, make a dent in that, you know, that waste of energy. Catalysts, which is basically trying to accelerate certain reactions, some chemical reactions, for instance, very important for hydrogen production, right? If you want to take water, split it into hydrogen and oxygen, that's actually a pretty expensive process. And so with a catalyst, you can accelerate and make that process more efficient energy-wise. Nitrogen fixation is the process by which people make um, fertilizers. It turns out it's extremely polluting. There's a lot of CO2 coming out of that process. It takes a lot of energy to produce this, but again, it's very important to feed the world. And then, you know, wholesale modeling um, is another application that's a little further away. But so you see that the amount of things we could do once we understand molecules better is, is very inspiring. So what do we need to be able to do better when we study molecules. The first thing is we need to be able to do more accurate simulations. And as I alluded to before, the way to do that is to approximate the quantum mechanics which governs the electronic structure because the electrons are basically 90%, represent 90% of the forces that are applied to the ions, to the, to the atoms here, um, but, but you can only compute them you know, exactly using quantum mechanical calculations but that very, very quickly um, is too expensive. So strong approximations here are important. Then we need to do faster simulations because um, an, an atom or a molecule wiggles at the time scale of a femtoseconds, which is a, a millionth of a billionth of a second. And so in order to do, you know, see molecules do anything interesting, you know, you need to speed that up by you know, maybe a thousand billion times or something like that. So you have to really make this a lot faster to see things, processes that we are actually interested in. Let's say, you know, a chemical that turns it from one, goes from one state into another state. And then finally, uh, we need to do, we need to be able to do simulations at much, much larger scales, not with tens of atoms, but uh, with hundreds of millions or even billions of atoms. Like for instance, the, you know, the proteins in the cell of a body or something like this of our body. So, um, so we went on to generate or to develop a number of graph neural networks that would now combine these two properties, the equivariance that I talked about, as well as this sort of graph neural nets. And of course, you can see why this is important for molecules. Uh, molecules look like a graph, for instance, first of all. Secondly, if I rotate a molecule, let's say, around its axis, we do not expect that the properties of that molecule change anything. It's basically the observer maybe that is rotating rather than that we expect that the properties of a molecule would change if we rotate it in space. So what we really want is we want graph neural networks that are equivariant under translations and rotations. And that's called uh, sort of equivariant, uh, EN equivariant graph neural nets. Um, so, so here is a, um, can, I ask a can I ask a question? Yeah, so, go, go uh, ahead. So, so, I mean, molecules look like a graph, but this is only if you look at their, their principle, I mean, they, they look like a graph, but the, you showed forces from, you know, X1 to XN acting on everything. So are you doing pairwise along the pr principal bonds or are you all pairs? Yeah, so that's a great question. In fact, there's different models that do different things. So, um, for scalability, it is really important that you don't do all pairs. Um, because uh, that's, well, right? yeah, so. yeah, so that's n squared and between the atoms, I think that is fine, right? So it seems like your direct neighbors have a much bigger impact on, on what, you know, where you are than your, your neighbors that are far away. Um, but for electrons, it's, it's more complicated, right? Because, uh, certainly electrons that are, uh, far away, um, you know, so there's some free electrons, which are actually able to, you know, to, to you move freely throughout the whole molecule and those you know would have apply forces which are much more long long range so but but for basically the models that we have looked at is both you know fully connected everybody interacts with everybody um, and as well as just looking at your neighborhood um, and it turned you know of course it's really just the ones that just look at neighborhoods are, are scale much better to larger molecules um, 
Right, so equivariance for a graph neural network looks as follows. So you take a graph, um, it has certain in, you know, properties, again, features which live on the nodes, which could be a representation of that particular atom. And then there is vector quantities. They could be the velocities or the forces. And then what we want is if we take one step of graph neural network filtering, which means that we change all these properties and we change these vector quantities as well, right? Then if we first do a of the molecule, so here we see that you know x4 rotates you know this position, so the whole thing rotates around. Now the invariant features here they they remain the same, right? So this set of things and this set of things doesn't change if we rotate because they're invariant features, and the vectors here they rotate in the way that you would expect, right? So this vector rotates with the whole thing to then become this thing. Now if we first rotate and then filter, or first filter and then rotate, we want to get the same result. That's the equivariance principle that we then, you know, put you know place onto our graph neural net. Now here is a sort of the set of equations that we used for these graph neural networks. These are actually quite fast because the don't do very complicated operations here. Um, you know, the, the ones that I'll show next quickly do more complicated things. Um, but I'll, I, I guess I'll just skip over this because we're running a little bit out of time, I think. Um, but you, you can sort of look at these equations. There's again, messages as I ex explained before, they now also depend on the distances between two molecules. And then there's some update of these vector quantities in such a way that they are actually vectors. So they rotate as vectors on the rotation. And then we do simple message, message aggregation again and updating all the features just like we do for a normal graph neural net. That's fast and that works actually quite well. Now just go quickly over extensions of this. So this is the SE3 transformer, which is a more sophisticated graph neural net that only looks at neighbors, but has a much more sophisticated way to represent functions. Um, instead of just vectors, there is now much more complicated functions on spheres that you can use to represent uh, the, you know, the, 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 the vectorial features for a node. We, we use spherical harmonics to do that, you know, details you should look up in the paper. Um, maybe it's interesting, and this is also a transformer like architecture with keys and queries and stuff. Um, now, what's interesting is that this type of thing has been used also in AlphaFold. So I think the AlphaFold you know, model is quite similar to this. They also called it SE3 transformer. Um, the details are probably quite different, um, but the, the idea is probably very similar. And that's of course to predict the actual um, forces on them on the atoms so that you can fold them uh, over time. Now this this I'll just show you because uh, you know there is a uh, you know as as a paper that that will come out most likely soon um, called steerable equivariant message passing on molecular graphs where we take this idea one step further. It's a very general architecture to design equivariant graph neural networks. Um, Okay, so I have until what time, Frank? How much more minutes do I have? That's a good question. Procedurally, that's a question for Aaron. Um, I wish that you could talk for the uh, for the remainder of the day. Uh, <laughs> I think I think there's an hour, or is it an hour and a half? Does Michael know? That's a good question. It's probably an hour, I think. But I how think much time hour. do we want to? Keep for questions. I think that's important. Uh, the questions have been slow in the chat channel. There are a couple of them right now, um, but um, uh, let me double check on the time. Let's plan for an hour and give give yourself ten minutes for five or ten minutes for questions, and maybe we can stay a little later if people are interested in. It. There's okay. a question right now re relevant relevant to what you're talking about. Uh, um, uh, is is the attention only calculated among the nodes in the one neighborhood, or or is attention, you know, yeah, just a neighbor. You have to define your neighborhood, but basically taking a sphere of a certain radius and then finding all the atoms that are in that radius. And then, you know, you get the attention uh, weights that you compute using query key, you know, computations just with those neighbors. Um, and now the trick with this transformer is that these, you know, the, 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 the weights are invariant on the rotations, but the values V must be equivariant uh, as transform as a vector um, under rotations. And that was a question from Emmanuel Salas, just to, to be clear, yeah. Okay, um, yeah. So then I'll just quickly say something about generative modeling. So this is known as inverse modeling or inverse, yeah, I think it's called inverse modeling. 
Um, so the idea is that um, we have been looking at models that go from X and then predict things about a molecule. But what if we could actually generate molecules with certain fixed properties? That would be sort of the grail because the chemist would just go, okay, give me a molecule with, these list, with this list of properties, including cheap and easy to synthesize. And then your neural network would just spit out a bunch of molecules which would have those properties, right? Now that's a clearly very difficult problem, but you can start to make, you know, to, to start modeling and see how hard it is. And we'll be using this idea of normalizing flows where you start with some very simple distribution like a Gaussian and you define a sequence of invertible maps that map you to an input distribution X, which is complicated. So here's the, the distribution, which is sort of complicated. Of course, for molecules way more complicated than high dimensional. And each one of these steps deforms this cloud into something un, un, until it looks like the actual distribution that you're interested in. And since this is invertible, you can actually write down the log likelihood in closed form and do gradient updates. Now we applied that idea to basically molecules. So you start with, you generate a bunch of molecules with certain types from a Gaussian distribution, including their positions. Um, and then you would define a flow that would sort of slowly assemble this chaotic bunch of atoms. You, would, you can actually change their, uh, their, uh, their type as you go and their charges, as well as their positions and you assemble them into a viable molecule according to this flow, right? And so we have actually trained these models. Um, now they're a little bit more involved than what I just said. So this is a model by uh, Emil Hogeboom and Victor Garcia Satoris. Um, so here you take your, your molecule, um, you have to first make everything that's discrete continuous. You do this by, by a process called dequantization. Then we used an ODE model uh, to flow from you know this space to sort of this abstract Gaussian space. Um, and then we had also distribution for the number of, of uh, atoms that you want in your distribution. So this is turns out to be an invertible map. You can flow backward using, you know, integrating in the other direction with your ODE um, to generate this. So now we can sample in this space and then flow in this direction. And if you do that, you get things like this. So here you have your, imp your input and you see it flows into a nice molecule. You can rotate it with the probability is maintained. And then this is the inverse transformation going back to the latent space where you can see change colors because that's actually um, allowed. Um, and then here you assemble them back and you can rotate again. Max, question on the chat channel. Is the number of generated from Ringy, you know, uh, is the number of generated atoms prefixed or sampled from another learnable distribution? Yeah, so it's actually the number of atoms is sampled from a, just a discrete distribution here. So that's this thing, a category number of number of atoms in the molecule. Yeah. Um, now, th this was still a bit slow um, and uh, many, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement here. So this is, I think, a great place to do research in my opinion. So the, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, solving PDE. So this is the last thing I got really excited about. This is work with uh, Johannes Brandstetter and um, Rob Hesseling and um, and uh, Elise Van der Poel and Eric, um, Eric Beckers. And um, so the idea is to write down a, a PDE. So a PDE is uh, basically a vector U as a function of X and T. And you write the time derivative of that vector field as some function of t and x and the field values u and their first derivatives and their second spatial derivatives. So that's the general description of a PD. You also need an initial vector field. You need some boundary conditions, right? And then you would like, given this initial field configuration, you would like to forward integrate to find the field configuration into the future. This is a super fundamental tool for all of science. Basically every scientist would actually you know, express their models in something like that. Of course, these days you have probabilistic programming and Frank knows all about it. And uh, that's, you can think of that also as a probabilistic version perhaps of these PDEs. Now, what we would like to do is, so there's a, there's a special case which looks a lot simpler, which is where you can express this as a continuity equation. That's, this expresses basically the fact that, you know, for every volume in space, the amount of stuff that goes in minus the amount of stuff that goes out is equal to the change in the amount of stuff in this volume. Now that sounds, that sounds pretty clear, but it basically means that uh, 
you cannot create or destroy stuff inside a volume. And that's a special class of models that is slightly easier to integrate. So what we did, um, and there's other there's other work in this direction too, but it's this is just a, a field that's just starting to uh, to evolve. Is we took a simple autoregressive model, so we take some function a given by a neural net that takes our current configuration u of x and t, and some delta t in which we want to forward integrate, and gives the configuration into the future. The way you train this is the way you would think you would train it, which is you say, I have my forward operator applied to my current configuration. I have some, some expensive numerical solver that will give me ground truth for the future. And then I want to make sure that A is trained such that I can actually predict the future, right? And then I need to sample, you know, use here from some distribution. There's a couple of tricks that you really need to do to make this work. One is temporal bundling. So you don't want to predict one time, one slice at a time because that's too slow. So you'll predict a number of slices at a time. And then there is a somewhat involved architecture, which is based again on a graph neural net, not just not quite equivariant yet, we're working on it. But here is um, you know, what you do. So you first take your U values, the values of your field U over, over time, so over, over a batch of time, you then send them through an embedding function to create your feature input features for a graph neural net. Then you will do graph neural net processing. So here again, you produce messages that look at your neighbors. So these are neighbors in space, integration points in space. Um, now it depends on a whole bunch of stuff. You just update your messages, send messages. Then you get your final values for these features that are now sitting on these nodes. Um, you then do a final time convolution to sort of smooth the signal a little bit. That gives you the next iteration of use. So it gives you a next batch of use for some points in the future. And then those will feed back into this phase and then you repeat, rinse and repeat, right? And then you back propagate through this, this whole set sequence here in order to train this thing up. Now, now the amazing thing is that this actually works uh, qu quite well. So. Here's the ground truth. So what we have is Berger's equation. It's a one dimensional equation. Um, so we have, but, but, but the equation that creates shock waves or very sharp transitions. So here we have X and here we have the value of U and the colors indicate time. So we go from blue to red. As you see, if you start with sort of this blue curve here, which is nice and smooth, if you forward integrate, what's happening is that you'll create these very sharp you know, transitions in space. And that is a pain for a numerical integrator. So you need very precise numerical integrators to do that. But our graph neural network was able to reproduce these, these, these uh, shock waves very nicely. And um, so here you see the sort of the number of um, integration points. So here this much coarser and faster architecture than this one. And it does produce these, these, uh, you know, these, these shock waves quite nicely. The cool thing is actually that you can also, you don't have to know the precise PDE. So you can parameterize a space of PDEs given by a bunch of parameters. Then you can sample example points, training points from different values of the parameters. And you can test on a new set of parameters and you can sort of generalize to new PDEs that you've never seen before. And what I find fascinating is that you could in fact also from data, learn the parameters of your PDE, which means that you can sort of learn the PDE that describes your data. We haven't done that part, but it seems possible with this setup. And here is a Navier-Stokes two-dimensional integration. So the other ones were one-dimensional. Here's a two-dimensional integration where here's the ground truth and here's the forward prediction of the, of the GNN model. Okay, I wanna conclude. I'm almost out of time. Um, I think, there is an interesting convergence happening. In, so we have seen that deep learning has disrupted fields like speech recognition, natural language processing, and um, let's say computer vision, but these are all engineering uh, fields. I think what's gonna happen next is deep learning is going to disrupt uh, scientific uh, uh, fields. And in particular, uh, physics, condensed matter physics, and molecular, or, or you know, as I say, uh, computational chemistry, quantum chemistry. There, I see 
very nice applications of the tools that we have been developing. So you should think of basically with the huge amount of um, computation that we now have access to, we can run expensive simulations of let's say that simulate the quantum mechanics. We store that in data. Then we train machine learning models on that data that can then accelerate again the simulations um, or make cheaper uh, simulations uh, more accurate. So you can think of this as sort of a continuous process where we sort of train up some kind of new tool, let's say a, maybe it's like a microscope or something like this for the, for the, chemical, uh, for the chemical sciences and the biology. Now, I'm personally extremely inspired by the applications that this could bring. I've mentioned sustainability, so carbon capture, hydrogen production, clean fertilizers, biodegradable plastics. You know, if we can design materials by better understanding, these types of things will come within reach. And in health, we can design new vaccines, antibiotics against resistant bacteria, and for instance, immunotherapy to fight cancer. So the nice thing is that why now, the question of why we should do th this now is a lot of things are coming together. In particular, some of these fields, scientific fields are, are progressing fast, like molecular biology is a clear example. Um, the modeling sciences are progressing fast, computational science, machine learning, and, and in 10 years or so, quantum computing, which will have an impact on this. And of course, all of this is driven by a societal need to improve drugs for you know, antibiotics, let's say, and for, for pandemics, and you know, to help us through the energy transition and create sustainable green technology. And with that, um, I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Awesome, as always. Thought-provoking, interesting, well-delivered, spectacular. Thank you. Um, I have about 800 questions myself, but that's, that's not the structure of this, uh, of this interaction. Um, there are three queued currently. I'll be watching the chat for others as, as they come. Uh, we've got Jeff who will ask a question about cryo EM. Jonathan will ask about the state of the art for uh, sparse uh, computation on GPU. And then the, my, my next Jan Willem van de Miet, uh, Baron Zwarzenberg, uh, will ask a question about uh, your equivariant uh, uh, networks for um, molecular stuff. Anyway, uh, so Jeff, please. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I, I posted a kind of longer version of my question, but the core of it is um, when, if we're trying to reconstruct a 3D object and we have many measurements of it and our measurements are depending on exactly the orientation it was, how it, how it projects things happen differently at the top when the you know electrons come and interact with the top versus the bottom. Um, how do we get at the symmetry of that when we have governing equations for how that interaction happens with PDEs? But how do we even think about what symmetry it is? Because it's no longer you know, symmetric in, in SO3 in the same way that it was just yeah. projected. I mean, there is a group. The, the, okay, so um, in, in the three-dimensional space in which you reconstruct, of course, there is a clear group structure, which is the rotation group. But the problem is, of course, in the images, uh, it's like a projective transformation or something like this. So it's my, it's, it's, and that's, um, so um, I would say um, you lose information in that projection. And so there's what's left is maybe an SO true transformation. Um, now, there's a couple of things. Actually, we are working on cry OEM. Uh, the, and um, so using symmetry transformation. So the way we sort of model this is by, this is, by the way, Gabriela Cesa Bianchi, uh, yeah, who, uh, who is working on that. Um, so basically, you would you would think of the molecule being projected onto a sphere. So all these projections, they're basically you can you know, think of them as, as as sort of mappings of the molecule onto a sphere. So the orientation is then where you will end up on the sphere, and then there is another SO true transformation that you can have, you know around the axis orthogonal to that sphere. Um, and then you basically try to denoise this map by looking at, if I would have to bring 
you know, this particular image and I have to shift it over this, over the sphere to another image, right? That's close by, you know, what will be the transformation that it would have to apply? And then you try to denoise it that way. There's a whole lot of symmetry uh, considerations that go into that particular, um, in, into that particular formulation. So I think it's actually very rich uh, in terms of symmetries and it's, they seem key actually to solve this problem. Great, so I, I, yeah, I look forward to seeing uh, what you guys come up with, that's great. Yeah, if the paper is, 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 is out, I'll let you know. Was, was that an answer, Jeff, or was that uh, just a naming a bunch? Well, of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean, you can, you can. it sounds like they're, they're, they're going at the kind of, you know, tomographic projection symmetry. And then there's another layer where, um, uh, you know, going, projecting top to bottom or bottom to top is actually different because of, uh, of uh, what happens temporally. Um, if the molecule is thick enough. And so, and that's something I'm not sure how to even think about that. Cool. So you, mean, awesome. you mean there's a chirality problem or no? Or uh, it it's sort of like uh, breaks the chirality when yeah. you model in um, that the object is actually very thick. And then when the plane wave is coming in, it, it, um, it interacts first with things on the top and then is no longer a plane wave and interacts and interacts and gets to the bottom. And if ah. it was... The chiral image upside down, it would be a different projection. Where if you just took a line integral, it would be identical. I see. Yeah. So th this seems like a much longer conversation. Um, I, so, <laughs> uh, so it certainly seems that the the cryo EM has a problem with chirality, right? So you cannot really determine the chirality. But um, but this now you're you're saying you have an actual model for how you know the the, you know the the image was taken as as, as I guess the electrons move through through yeah the, yeah I can write a big long email all about it yeah well why don't we do that um, and then we can move to the next question but uh, I'd love to uh, to hear more about it and then Great. maybe I can um, I can also introduce you to uh, my collaborator fantastic yeah thank you for all of those um, who are still listening this is an opportunity to see Max swing from one one subject to the next and cover all bases so Jonathan is next with a question about sort of modern uh, compute and how it, how efficient it is. Go ahead. Okay, my question is definitely easier. So <laughs> that's good. Um, I, I'm just wondering more on the nuts and bolts side of how you actually implement GNNs on GPUs, given that sparse vector products and these sort of things tend to be difficult and slow compared to their more denser, like convolution tensor product counterparts. Like, can you implement them in terms of regular convolutions with some clever zero padding or something? Well, that's actually a harder question for me since- uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, since, <laughs> you have to, have to ask Max whether or not he's ever implemented one of these things, that's the- <laughs> Yeah, so then the answer is no. Um, but uh, but yeah, so, so let's see. So I think we are really implementing these as actually message updates, right? Because the graph can be quite irregular. Um, so I, I really think we, we um, well, I mean, you can do it in parallel because every node, you know, has a number of neighbors and that remains fixed and you should, you're collecting information from your neighbors and you do an update. So you can do all these nodes in parallel. Um, however, I don't think this is implemented as a regular convolution, but with some kind of sparsity pattern um, involved. But anyway, I, I, you know, the answer to that would have to come from uh, the person who is actually you know, turning on the knobs uh, with the implementation. And I can certainly introduce you to the person who implemented all that. You can send an email actually to, to uh, Victor Garcia. Um, he would maybe, be able to Maybe you. I can help a bit on this. I, in my experience, so the implementation of those genes are all like in parallel in the sense that uh, all nodes, when you compute the message passing, it's compacted into a single matrix uh, multiplication. So in the end, uh, it's still like convolution called the matrix verification. It's just you need to do some pre-precise to type everything. Renji, I think you and, you and Jonathan should uh, should meet up. Let's uh, let's let's <laughs> extract the absolute maximum we can from from Max while uh, while, while we've got him. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, next question from uh, Jan Willem Bandemit, uh, version 2.0, L Baron Schwarzenberg. You could uh, you know you could actually proceed in Dutch here. That would be pretty cool. 
Um, but let's let's not for the rest of us. Uh, so uh, Baron has a has a question about conditional sampling in the in your, your models. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. And uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, yeah, I'm like very excited by those uh, normalizing flows over over molecules. Uh, and I was kind of wondering, uh, is it possible to make those sort of conditional so that like say given a particular property, give me a molecule that that has that property? Is that something that you thought about? That's where we're working on it. Um, so we are currently working on diffusion models that condition on properties and then generate molecules with those properties. That's absolutely what you want, right? So the, the ones that we did here was you have a large data set and you sort of generate back molecules from the data set, but you really want to condition on properties and then generate the molecules with those properties. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, where a lot of groups are working on now to, to find good generative models Conditioned on properties. Yeah, but it sounds like you're going in a slightly different direction with it than the the normalizing flows from uh, from earlier. Well, yeah. So we, we are currently looking exploring diffusion uh, based models, but you know, yeah, I, I guess you could you could also do it with normalizing flows. Um, diffusion models are quite similar in a way, uh, except for that uh, you can train them more in parallel. So you can basically mm -hmm. train all the layers uh, in parallel, and that's kind of uh, Kind of faster. And that's helpful because the ODEs that we did, the OD, the ODEs were slow. They were they had to do they had to go all the way up and then all the way back and then you had a gradient. Um, the ODE itself was slow, so that's that's not the best architecture if you want speed. Mm -hmm. All right, aren't necessarily so fast for sampling though. But anyway, uh, uh, thanks. The diffusion have... models are not fast for sampling because there's too many layers. You think? Or... And it's another knobs. It's another knobs concern. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, we have a, we have another, <laughs> we have a. Uh, thanks, Bern. Uh, we have another question from Renji uh, on on out of uh, distribution generalization for PDEs. Hi, Max. Thanks for the nice talk. So, so I may I may miss some part on your last part on PDEs. So I assume that your PDEs are uh, the uh, parameters are kind of given, not learned from data at this moment. And then you train on some uh, train on some GM based solvers to train, uh, to solve such PDs in the training cases and then test it on others. So I'm wondering how you uh, uh, observe those things generalized to other distribution PDs. Because uh, my experience of training GM based solvers for other problems is the OD generalization tends to be pretty bad. Yeah. So yeah, I you know I I it the actual figures were on the slide, um, but I, I agree it's not easy. So you see there's clearly a difference, right? So it, it is true that, um, you know, it's not perfect, but the fact that you can do it at all, I thought was quite fascinating. So we had one dimensional PDEs. It was basically a, a linear combination of uh, Berger's equation, Korteweg de Vries equation, and I think something like diffusion or the heat equation or something like that. So th those were in there. Um, with three parameters, and then we just randomly sample these parameters and test on others. So uh, it seemed to work reasonably well. In fact, um, some of these some of these have very weird, difficult behavior with lots of oscillations and things, and so that's harder to reproduce. Um, but it worked surprisingly well in that sense. So um, of mm -hmm. course that's not very quantitative, and um, but I don't think anybody is really. I mean, do you, if you know of interesting work that already does this, then we can start to compare on metrics and stuff. But I think it's a very interesting, interesting problem. I mean, that's, I I, I'm going to jump in front of Emmanuel who has a, has a question here. I mean, in, in some sense, is this, is this not kind of the same as the neural programmer interpreter, right? You're, you're giving control flow, basically, you're giving control flow path examples for deterministic computation, and you're, you know, providing training signal at every, at every step. Are you asking, who are you asking, Frank? Or ah, uh, you, yeah, <laughs> me. Oh, no, yeah. I don't know. I know. I, I, I'm not going to say anything about probability program because I don't know. That's nothing to do yeah. with probability programming. That's Scott Reed and Nando DeFridis. It's their neural programmer interpreter. Basically, you you have you know the you have uh, unrollings of deterministic computation graphs where you get you know uh, you get observations of what the computation the intermediate products of the computation are at every time step. You're doing forward integration. You give your neural network training signal, which is the intermediate yep. computation value at every time step, yep. kind of the same thing, right? Yeah, no, that's exactly what that is. Um, 
So, so there is actually, so this field is so fast developing that there is tricks that are super important um, to keep things stable, for instance, when you forward propagate. And one of the things that I didn't really talk about is you really need to train with noise. So in other words, you need to provide the noise to the input that it will experience when you actually integrate forward in time. And if you don't do that, things will very quickly run in the wrong direction if you, if, because they accumulate errors. But if you train with the right noise, then you can stabilize that. All these types of small tricks are super important to make these things work. And I feel we're just at the very, very beginning of this field. And I, you know, so, uh, you know, so I, I think it's possible, but difficult perhaps. And maybe yeah, we that's a lot of, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like a diff tree diffusion model that you also have noise relation so that the training actually becomes smoother and easier. Yeah, I was, I was wondering whether your equivalent uh, design component could make OD generalization easier because uh, that injects some yes. prior into this uh, gene Very environment. Good. Very yeah, good question. I wonder, I wonder whether you tried already. Yes, well, otherwise yes. I, okay. we're working on it. You're asking great questions, all you, because you know, you're basically touching on all the projects that we have in the lab. But so this is certainly one. It's very rich and interesting because you can compute all the local symmetries um, of your PDEs. And, and these are there's a surprisingly large and rich set of symmetries in these PDEs and quite different from just boring rotations and translations, right? These are you know, the mixed together U and X and T values and stuff like that. Now the representation theory for these transformations I don't think is known. And, and, and so we would probably have to go do approximate uh, integration of these symmetry of these symmetries and it's a very interesting and rich field but, but I agree it needs to be used because there is it, you get it for free right you know the symmetry of your PDE this basically means that you can perfectly predict some points on some on some parts of your integration uh, by your symmetries and so not using them not using it is, is uh, somewhat of a crime I think uh, speaking of a crime, it would be uh, a crime if we did not accommodate Emmanuel's uh, uh, question. I think, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I was interested in the formulation of the equivariant graph layer, uh, particularly that. Um, so I, I wanted to like ask just what aspect of it exactly that guarantees the rotational in, um, invariance of um, among the graphs. Is it? Like the thing that I noticed that's different here is that is mostly just that you're passing in the squared distance between embeddings at each layer. Is that yeah. enough to guarantee the rotational invariance? Yeah, that's invariance, right? So if, uh, so if you only pass along invariant things, then of course the final result will be invariant. But the challenge is to, to use equivariant, equivariant yeah, you know, vectors yeah. and tensors and stuff like that. So for the first, it was basically, we took a, a vector and you update a vector by basically you can just think of now take the vector on node i, take the vector on node j, and multiply them by complicated invariant functions. Now, okay. that is a vector that can change, um, but it's still a vector, and so it's equivariant. Now, much more interesting is it when you use spherical harmonics to look at higher order representations, not just of three vectors, but higher order representations. And you know, if you use spherical harmonics, then you know that you get, have the right transformation properties. So in the SE3 transformer and the other paper that I alluded to there, we use this much more complicated sort of, uh, um, and also slower uh, um, sort of uh, spherical harmonic representation. Uh, I see. Yeah, so you can look it up in the paper basically, the details. Thank you. Max, I think we've exhausted the <clears throat> the list of questions on the on the chat channel. Um, and these were great uh, questions. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 pleased. Uh, I have you know a million, but I, I know it's late and you have a family. So uh, and eventually, if COVID finally breaks for real, we'll get to see one another, and I'll get to ask you them all in person. So I have I have that privilege. So I'll I'll, I'll spare you my questions. If are then there any one day. One day you can come to Amsterdam, Frank, because you know, you know, Jan Willem is now in Amsterdam, so I'll, I'll expect you in Amsterdam now quite a lot, actually. Uh, you know, between you, Jan Willem, Bert, you know, whatever, uh, and you know, 
yeah, it's uh, there are many, many reasons to come. Uh, right. And hopefully, Jan can 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 poke some of this prom prog stuff into your in, into your head. So it's very relevant. Beautiful talk. Thank you very much. And uh, as always, spectacular work. So thank you very much, Max. It was super thank nice you, Frank. You. All uh, right. And thank you, everyone. Nice job. Cheers. Bye bye.